one of Hollywood's toughest and most unique filmmakers, Robert Aldrich, who's responsible for such classics as Whatever Happened to Baby Jane and The Dirty Dozen, had one of his greatest and most cherished successes with the thrilling adventure classic, The Flight of the Phoenix. The film had an all-star cast, including Jimmy Stewart, Richard Attenborough, Peter Finch, Ernest Borgnine, and Hardy Krueger. It's based on the novel by Trevor Dudley Smith from 1964 that bears the same name. And it's the tale of a cargo plane that crashes in the Sahara Desert. It has no working radio or access to potable water. The survivors ultimately overcome numerous obstacles that they encounter to construct a smaller plane from the wreckage of the original plane and fly it to safety. Now, this idea is really fact-based in that there was a real-life event in which a twin-engine cargo plane crashed in the desert. In this actual incident, the flight mechanic was able to construct a one-engine plane that was flown with six crewmen strapped to the wing to an Allied base. The movie begins with a takeoff of a twin-engine aircraft that's been asked to ferry oil field workers to Benghazi. The aging pilot, Frank Towns, portrayed by Jimmy Stewart, is nearing the end of his flying career. The only other flight crew member is an alcoholic navigator, portrayed by Richard Edinburgh. Due in part to their inattention to detail, the flight takes off with an inoperative radio and a faulty voltage regulator. As they're en route, the plane flies through a sandstorm and is forced to make a crash landing. They've been pushed off course and have no means of contacting help. So those that survived the crash are stranded in the desert. They have a very limited supply of water, and their only food is pressed dates. Initially, they made the assumption that they would be rescued, but soon after they realize the precariousness of the situation. After they've been stranded for five days, and they've endured two sandstorms, and one of the passengers' mental collapse. Two of the passengers realize that they need to take action. Captain Harris proposes a march to safety, but most of the other crew are dissuaded from doing this. A 10-mile hike through the desert doesn't seem like a viable solution to the problem. Harris and another passenger march away from the wreckage, and Harris soon returns alone and defeated. The hike also resulted in the death of a third passenger. Heinrich Dorfman, another passenger on this unfortunate adventure, proposes a totally different solution. After he studies the situation in detail, he announces that they have everything necessary to build another plane out of the current crashed plane and fly it to safety. The plane's pilot immediately reacts with severe skepticism and ridicule of the idea. This ends up setting the stage for a conflict that continues for the rest of the movie. Later, the pilot and the navigator realize that Dorfman is an aircraft designer by trade. But what they don't realize until the end is that he didn't design real planes. He designed model planes. When these two find this fact out, you can see the blood drain from their faces. Principal photography started... April 26, 1965, at the 20th Century Fox Studios, and also at 20th Century Fox Ranch. They used a variety of filming locations to simulate the desert. Some of them were Buttercup Valley, Arizona, and Ball Knob Mesa, California. The flying sequences were filmed in California's Imperial Valley on the western fringes of Yuma, Arizona. They used an assortment of planes to put together this film. The primary one that you see is a Fairfield C-82A. That's used for the flying shots, the outdoor location wreck, and the indoor studio wreck. A specially built plane, done by Tallmance Aviation, was put together and christened the Phoenix P-1. All of the Fairfield Seas were from Stuart Davis, Incorporated in Long Beach, California. Although principal photography was completed August 13, 1965, 
In order to complete the filming, a North American O-47A from the Plains of Fame Air Museum in Chino, California, was modified and used as the Flying Phoenix stand-in. With the canopy removed, a set of skids was attached to the main landing gear, as well as a vertical fin added to the tail. This sufficed as a more or less visual look-alike for the plane. According to the director, the cast went out at night in Yuma, Arizona, where they were doing the bulk of the filming. They went driving around and just causing mayhem. There was a lot of drinking that went on during this shoot. The cast used to drive around with prop dummies that were used during the crash scene, and they would throw them out the cars as they were moving along so that bystanders thought they were real people. Jimmy Stewart, being the goody two-shoes that he was, was kind of an outsider and was kind of standoffish with the bulk of these European actors. But pretty soon, he got in on the fun too. He took a prop machine gun and jumped out of the car to finish off one of the dummies gangland style. The police department ended up stopping them, but when they found out it was Jimmy Stewart, they let them all go. It said that the director and Jimmy Stewart had a never-ending job of trying to keep Peter Finch sober so that they could get filming completed. Jimmy Stewart plays a pilot in this movie, a pilot named Frank Towns, and this is pretty similar to him in real life. He had flown many missions in World War II, and he was still officially in the United States Air Force Reserve when this film was made. When Heinrich Dorfman, played by Hardy Krueger, is constructing the steel that they use, Ratbags, played by Ian Banning, taunts him and sarcastically wonders why the Germans never won the war. Dorfman ends up staring down Ratbags, declaring that he wasn't involved in the conflict. But in truth, the actor joined the Hitler Youth at age 13 and was drafted into the German army at age 16. Now the plane they flew out of there, the Phoenix, which was really a flyable plane, which was built by Talmots Aviation specifically for this movie. It had a length of 45 feet, a wingspan of 42 feet, and a like new Pratt & Whitney engine with 650 horsepower. The apparent wing, tail, and undercarriage wire bracing was made out of clothesline and was intentionally made to look flimsy. The fuselage was all built by hand from scratch, plywood over a wood frame. The cockpit was shallow and makeshift. The pilot sat down and another person stood behind the pilot and was strapped to a stringer. The plane's takeoff was considered too dangerous to stage at the Sandy filming location. Its actual takeoff was from a smooth, compacted earth runway. The legendary stunt pilot, Paul Mance, would be the one flying, and he was asked to do touch-and-go landings where he came in real slow and skimmed his landing gear along the ground and then throttled up to gain altitude, which merely simulated a takeoff. On the second take, as the landing gear made contact with the ground, the plane's aft boom fractured, causing the aircraft to nose into the ground and start to cartwheel. This crash ended up killing Paul Mance. This second take, where the crash occurred, was really just what they call a protection shot, and it wasn't necessary footage. They had gotten all the film that they needed on the first attempt. This crash also injured stuntman Bobby Rose, but he was able to recover. As the final credits roll on the screen, a tribute to Paul Mance is given. That tribute reads, It should be remembered that Paul Mance, a fine man and a brilliant flyer, gave his life in the making of this film. If you've never seen The Flight of the Phoenix, take the time to watch it. It's an interesting take on how personalities under stress react to situations. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll continue to chase the classics.